Greetings, folks. It's Professor Fiore, and welcome to the fourth and final part of our discussion on the Pocket Rocket Personal Amplifier. In part four here, we're going to take a look at the output section, the power chip that will drive your headphones or a small loudspeaker. Right? So to recap, part one was an overview of the entire circuit. Part two was on the input stage, the preamp stage with the distortion. Part three covered the EQ section. And now part four, we're going to look at the output section. So some points, okay? First of all, this uses the LM386. This was originally uh, put out by National Semiconductor. Uh, National Semi was eventually uh, absorbed by Texas Instruments. So you could still get it from TI. Um, so this, this is a, a nice little a power op amp and it was designed specifically for things like table radios and uh, little items like that that didn't need a ton of power um, we're basically talking depending on the power supply you're going to use and what the load impedance is we're basically talking maybe half a watt to a watt which doesn't sound like a lot but you have that kind of power going into a pair of standard headphones It'll be plenty loud. You know, typical headphones are maybe 50 ohms per side. So this will work just fine, actually, as it turns out. Um, you know, if you have a big amplifier, a, you know, stereo amplifier in your home system, let's say, and you have a, um, a uh, headphone output jack on it, they're, in many cases, going to have dropping resistors in there because you try to put, uh, you know, 200 watts into a, a pair of headphones, you're going to fry them you know you're going to fry them like uh you know like play the beans so this is designed expressly for that and it's designed for minimum parts it's designed to work off a single polarity power supply so there's there's going to be a, a little a couple of things we're going to have to do to accommodate that as you'll see but it's going to work off a single polarity po power supply um, with minimal external components that you have to add really just a couple of components in a minimal configuration. We're going to do something a little bit better than a minimal configuration. But, you know, the whole point here is it's set up so that you don't have to uh, allocate board space and other components in a design. In fact, it's set up so that it will default to a gain, a voltage gain of 20. But through the addition of an external component, you can get a gain of up to 200. Now, suppose you're thinking, well, okay, you know, this is nice, but my goal is I want to build a little practice amp that you know, I don't have to use headphones with. I'm thinking of, you know, a 20-watt amplifier or, you know, a 35-watt amplifier or something like that. I've got a little 8-inch loudspeaker, 10-inch loudspeaker, and that's, that's what I want to use. Something that's small and portable, but I can play it you know, with maybe a couple of other people, you know, my bass player buddy or, you know, whatever. And, you know, we can play at a normal sort of level, not using headphones. Well, it turns out there's a very sort of easy kind of modifications we can do. All right. And if you want to go crazy, you can really get like monster output if you want. It's, it's really something, the kinds of, of power audio amplifier ICs that are available now. But moving along. Once again, here's our circuit. So part two, we looked at the drive preamp. Part, uh, part three, we looked at the EQ section. And now part four, we're looking down here. All right, so we're going to dive into this. Now, this chip, right, IC2 is this LM386. All right, so this is a little 8-pin mini-dip chip. Now, the only required components really are an input and output um, coupling capacitor and this R21, R, uh, excuse me, uh, C21, which is a little uh, load compensation RC network, okay? There are some other elements like C20, 18, and 19 uh, that improve the performance. I'll just put it that way. R20 and C17 has really nothing to do with the power amp. That's another thing we're going to be looking at. Okay. C16 over here is a DC blocking cap because you don't want DC interfering with the prior circuit. So we have to block that. 
Now, before I go any further, you might be wondering, hey, wait a minute. I've got a blocking cap right here, C15. Why is there one over here? Well, in both cases, we want to block the DC from getting to P5, the volume control. All right, so this is just going to act as a voltage divider. You know, if you want 100% volume, in other words, 10, right? Or spinal tap, 11, right? You put that all the way up, you get 100% of the signal. You bring it all the way down, you're at ground, you get nothing. So you just run this up and down, all right? Now, this pot, like the drive pot, should be a log or audio taper pot. Unlike the standard pots, P2, P3, and P4 that we had in the EQ section, right? These are standard, everyday, normal, linear pots. But these two, you really want those to be audio taper. I mean, if you had a linear pot and you put it in here, it would work, but the rotation of the pot would be like overly sensitive in some parts and very insensitive in other parts. So you really want to get an audio taper pot for this. All right. So as you, anyway, as you go up and down, it's just a voltage divider and you tap off a signal. You don't want DC on something like a volume control because if there's any grit or garbage on this uh, material, on the resistive material, you can get a scratchy sound when you start to rotate the pot. If there's DC on it, that will get worse. And it'll sort of magnify that, that scratchy effect. Okay, so that's really what C16 is doing over here, okay? Now, the R20 C17, that's completely separate. We'll look at that in a minute. Let's focus in on the chip. So here's uh, an, an equivalent circuit of the 386. So the default gain of 20 would occur when pins 1 and 8 are open. So we're really only going to use these six pins. Right, so VS, there's your power supply, your source. Um, and then ground, right? So it's not a plus and minus, it's not a bipolar power supply. That's pin four. The standard plus and minus input pins, right? Two and three, and then five over here is the V out. And this is what's gonna go out to the loudspeaker or the headphones. Okay, so here's the internal. And if you look at this, you realize this, is, this should look very uh, familiar. What we have is a differential amplifier on the front end, right? Here's the inverting input. Here's the non-inverting input. So we basically have uh, a Darlington differential amplifier over here, right? Here's the one Darlington. Here's the other Darlington. There's your inputs coming in on the base. And then we have down here a current mirror, which is an active load. This goes off into a direct coupled class B uh, drive situation, class A driver into a class B output. Standard diode bias, little current source here up here to set up the trickle bias. And we just have a Zikli pair, a composite PNP uh, on the PNP side, okay? Now notice coming off of V out, there is a resistor going back to one of the inputs. This is essentially built-in feedback. So this 15K along with, with these, right, this 150 and 1.35, will set up a gain for you. And like I said, the, the default gain is 20. And if you put something, another resistor out here, you can, you know, partially cancel out uh, 1.35k, make that a lower value, and you'll get more gain, all right? So this is like the RF, and this is the RI, essentially. So, uh, but it is a differential input. So, you know, it wouldn't just be 15k over uh, 1.5k, right? When you add these up, it's actually double that, all right? Because it's differential. Anyway, um, so that's what we're looking at for the, for the chip, right? And there's, of course, VS, the power supply rail, all right? So when we set it up, Here's my chip, my 386. Um, what's new, fun, and different, right? So the, the manufacturer tells you, you need R21 and C21. 10 ohm, 47 nano for stability out here. C22 is actually the biggest physical component in the circuit. It's a 470 microfarad capacitor. And that will give you a sufficient low frequency extension if you're gonna drive an 8 ohm loudspeaker, All right? So this is shown as a stereo jack, left, right. It is, in fact, dual mono, right? Because you're, you know, unless you have something special, um, maybe you have, an, uh, have a, a, a Rickenbacker 4003 with Ricco sound pickups, you could, uh, you know, have one each, but that's not really what this is designed for. This gives you the same signal. It's dual mono into left and right. 
if you did have something like that, or maybe it's like a Chapman stick, you have separate outputs for high and low. Um, maybe you could make two of these, you know, there's different ways you could go about this, but, um, just to be straight about this, so there's no confusion, this is really dual mono. You got one chip driving both halves, okay, for your headphones. All right, uh, I already talked about the, the uh, coupling caps over here and the volume control. What's going on up here with C18 and C19? Well, this is a standard power supply bypass. And this is a little trick that we like to do. Instead of just sticking on um, you know, like a 10 mic, because these are going to be aluminum electrolytics which are not known for their super high quality and frequency extension. Um, what we do is we shunt it with a higher quality, smaller capacitor like a polyester cap. So I've got like a 100 nanofarad film cap over here, which will effectively make this thing look like a much nicer ideal cap. It's a lot cheaper than going out and buying, say, a 10 microfarad polypropylene cap. You know, that can be pretty expensive and they're physically pretty big. So that's a little trick that we can use. C20 down here is optional, and it improves the common mode rejection ratio of the amplifier. So, hey, why not throw it in, okay? Again, your power supply, you know, if it's a 9-volt battery, that's not really a bad source if you think about it. There's no ripple on a battery, but maybe you're going to use a 9-volt, uh, you know, a wall wart, uh, you know, a battery eliminator. And depending on the quality of that, you know, there might be some ripple on it. So, you know, let's hedge our, hedge our bets a little bit, okay? So... We include that for that performance. And then finally, we've got this switch, R20 and C17. So this is the bright switch. Normally, you would leave this open, and that would be the bright position. And what ends up happening is it's like R20 and C17 aren't, aren't even here. The input impedance to this amplifier is much larger than 10K, so... Really no effect, no, no appreciable voltage divider effect on that. But what happens when you close the switch? Well, what happens is you wind up with a little lag network between R20 and C17. So you got a 6.8 uh, nanofarad capacitor and a 10K. When you figure that out, you're going to get a, a critical frequency somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 2.3, 2.4 kilohertz, I forget exactly. But what that does is it rolls off the high frequencies, right? So above about, let's say, two and a half kilohertz, you start rolling off the high frequencies at about six decibels per octave. So not a huge amount. You know, it's not like a really steep kind of curve, but it's a sufficient curve. And it will sort of reflect what you would get if you were listening to your guitar going through maybe a 10 or 12 inch loudspeaker, right? That will not extend out to, you know, 10, 15 kilohertz, really nice. It's going to start rolling off. So, you know, you would need some kind of tweeter, some kind of uh, little horn or another loudspeaker in there, a small loudspeaker to get the highest harmonics. So we can simulate that. It's not perfect, but it's a very simple, effective kind of thing by throwing in this little uh, lag network, right? So to engage the bright switch, in other words, to make it dull, to make it sound more like maybe a 12-inch loudspeaker, you engage the switch, and that throws C17 into the circuit, and we get that roll-off, so all those high frequencies, those highest frequencies in the last, you know, let's say two octaves start to roll off uh, before they even get into the amplifier, all right? So there you go. Now, I would really like to do a, a simulation on this, but I was unable to find a good um, spice model for the 386, but, you know, it is just a little amplifier. So I don't think we're losing too much by that. But I would like to talk for a minute about doing something different. Like I said um, previously, maybe you want to make a bigger output power. You know, maybe you want to make an amplifier that's, you know, 10 watts or 25 watts or something like that. You're going to drive a, you know, 8, 10-inch loudspeaker um, to more like conversational levels so you can sit around with some, some pals and, and play, right? Um, so you can just deep six this whole thing. And there are tons of new generation ICs that you can use. So the 386 is a standard, as we saw just a moment ago. It's a standard, you know, class AB kind of output, right? Well, you can get bigger versions of that. You can buy chips that'll, you know, pump out 10 watts, 20 watts, whatever. But you can also get class D switching chips now that'll produce 
a lot of power. It all depends on what you're interested in. You know, you can get 50 watts, 100 watts. Here's the real trick, all right? It's going to need a different power supply. So you're not gonna be able to piggyback off of that original nine volt battery that we had. You know, and let's, let's be honest here, you can't expect that you're gonna get a 50 watt output off of a nine volt battery and have it last for more than you know a fraction of a second. So um, yeah, we are gonna need a separate power supply from that. You know, and all depending on how big the chip is in terms of its output power, because physically they can still be quite small. Um, you know, you 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 might actually wind up spending most of your money, the, most of your budget on the power supply, right? Um, you know, you could just buy one off the shelf. You could could design your own from scratch too, but uh, you know, all depends on how far you want to go. The power chip is going to require something, you know much more robust. So maybe it's going to need 50 volts. Maybe it's going to need, you know, plus and minus 50 volts for that matter. So you just have to plug that in here. Um, essentially, you could still use all of this. It may or may not have a DC, uh, DC at zero input. And if it doesn't, you'd have to have some kind of coupling capacitor out here and it would have to be big enough. The voltage rating on it would have to be big enough so that, um, you know, we don't have any issues with that cap failing, right? You know, all of the voltage ratings on these caps are really quite small. You know, if you could get a standard 16 volt cap for any of these things, that would be more than sufficient, all right? But you start using a, a power supply that's, you know, 50 volts, 75 volts, we're gonna have to look at some beefier voltage ratings on the capacitors, all right? But usually when you go through the, uh, the data sheet for that, power chip, they'll give you all those kinds of details. And, and really, they've made using those kinds of chips as easy as possible because they're trying to make your life a designer as easy as possible. That makes it more likely that you're going to use their chip in your design, right? So, you know, they're not thinking. I mean, TI is not thinking in terms of, you know, Mary or Joe down in the corner that want to play their guitar, and, you know, build their own circuit. They're, of course, thinking of, of a designer working for some company who's going to make a commercial product that's going to sell thousands, tens of thousands of, of units, hundreds of thousands of units, right? So they want to make it as easy as possible for you to do the design. That's why the 386 is a minimal parts count, right? They want to make it as easy as possible. You know, back in the 1980s, that's was still true, you know, make it as easy as possible for the designer to, to uh, you know, realize the output function that they want. Okay. Okay. So that kind of explains everything. Um, if you have any questions, you know what to do, right? We got the comments down below in the video, and I'll be happy to answer them uh, for you. So I hope you've enjoyed this four part video on the Pocket Rocket. You know, this is something I designed, oh, it's been nearly 40 years now that I think about it, a little less than that. And, you know, I've used it, I loved it, and I just figured, hey, there seem to be an awful lot of, you know, uh, fellow audio fanatics out there and musicians. Maybe you could use it too. All right, so just remember, this is released under a Creative Commons license. So it's fine for personal use, educational use, not for commercial use. Don't think you're going to take the pocket rocket and, um, you know, start churning out copies and selling them, right? That's not, that's not why it's here, okay? It's for your personal use and enjoyment, all right? Okay, so until next time, this is Professor Fiore saying, have a good one.